Welcome back to another episode of Light Beer, Dark Money. I'm Sean Noble. And I'm Chris Clements. And we are honored. Honored. Absolutely. Have, uh, Blessed. Daniel Scarponato as a guest today. He is the host of Scarp and Friends, a podcast, a fairly new podcast. We've had a, I don't know, dozen episodes maybe? Yeah. So we started in July. Great. Just aiming to, to be you guys one day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> You've probably surpassed us already. Yeah. Um, and then, but more, you know, more importantly, he's was uh, Governor Ducey's chief of staff before that, the communications director, press secretary. Um, before that, he was the NRCC, the comms director at the NRCC. And, and it, in that role, this, is, this goes back a while. You're, you're going way back. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this was uh, the beginning of 2014. I uh, had a conversation with Daniel, and he was like, yeah, I want to get back to Arizona. I was like, you should come work with us. He said, that'd be great. We had it all planned out. And so I've been yelled at by four members of Congress in my life. Uh, three that knew me <laughs> only personally. Four? Only four. Three that knew me personally, and they were pretty rough. And then the fourth is, uh, was Greg Walden. Oh, wow. He called me. He was the NRCC chairman. He called me the day after I, you know, Scarp and I decided that he was gonna, we were going to work together. And he ripped me. Oh, my. How <laughs> dare you try I to take away. I didn't Yeah. He was pissed. Wow. And so I think we had a conversation, or maybe I had Kirk call you, and, yeah, maybe you should stay there for the rest <laughs> of the cycle. So it wasn't until after the 2014 election, you know, I would suggested to the governor that maybe Kirk would be interested in being the chief of staff. And as soon as that happened, Scarp's like, yep, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know that, but I do remember uh, how that went down. And, uh, and uh, Greg Walden's a phenomenal guy, he and he was great to work for for um and with and uh i eventually did make it back to arizona with your help so thank you sean <laughs> yeah it was just a little delayed and i had to take a, a tongue lashing for it but it's all right it was all right yeah <laughs> kind of goes with the territory yeah there. well and i mean so you came and you were uh comms director for the governor and then eventually became his chief of staff i, I have told people that i mean it's not even close that that governor ducey has been the most successful governor in Arizona history. Well, I think given the current state of affairs and, and the results of the last election, we're going to find out how real effective he was and how much we're going to miss him oh, within no like question. six months. Well, probably sooner. So, yeah. So <laughs> talk to us about, a, you know, you, you were there from the beginning and was, you were there through the good times and the bad, the pandemic. I mean, what, what are your big takeaways? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And I, um, my connection started really, it was two days after the 2014 election, and um, I was walking to lunch in Eastern Market in D.C., and I got a call from Doug Ducey asking me to, to come back to Arizona and work for him. And I didn't know him that well. We had gotten to know each other a little bit through that race, even though I was in DC and I would help ghostwrite things from time to time. Um, but it was really on a whim and I just had a lot of admiration for, for him and respect for him and felt like he was gonna really be a transformational governor. And so on Veterans Day 2014, I got on a plane, uh, flew here, got went to the rental car facility at Sky Harbor, all they had left were minivans. And, <laughs> and I pulled up to this building that we're in today, which was where the governor's transition headquarters right. was. And I was just so impressed how he really was all about at that moment, like, hey, the campaign's over and here are all the things I wanna get done. And he had a whiteboard in his office in this building where he had all this stuff written and when I think now about where we are eight years later, I mean, I think he checked everything off that whiteboard and then some. Um, we didn't quite get to no income tax, right. but we got pretty darn close uh, given all, all the challenges that It's unfolded. the lowest flat, ta lowest lowest flat, flat tax, tax in the nation. In right? the nation. Yeah. Um, actually, I think it's Danny Seiden who jokes it's even lower than Texas's flat tax um, <laughs> since they don't have one. Uh, <laughs> So I think that, um, I just think he's so driven, so goal driven, and it's that private sector experience, I think that, uh, and just his, the nature of who he is. 
and really also I think the staff has been incredible and the, the longevity of people that he's had because he's just a good guy and a good guy to work for and he just treats people with a lot of respect. Yeah. No, he's, yeah. He, got, he definitely has that executive, that corporate executive management style in, in that he, he gave his staff a lot of room. Yeah. You know, these are the goals. You figure out how to make it happen. And for the most part, it worked out very well. Uh, well, and I think at least speaking from my standpoint, when I think about, I mean, I feel like I've, I've aged 100 years from eight years ago. <laughs> and But so much of it is that he did delegate to staff, and he really, I think, pushed all of us to, um, to achieve things professionally that, that we may not have even contemplated we were capable of. And so he put so much trust in us, and it was really the advice he gave me when I became chief, is he said, you know, delegate and follow up, and the whole team here works for you and you work for me. So I think, again, it was just he, he surrounded himself, I think, with people who who were aligned with, with his vision and who could help him get it done. Yeah, I, one of the things that has been very interesting, it was very interesting to watch through the entire tenure of Governor Ducey was that there was almost zero internal drama within, you know, every governor, the president, you know, every governor has these, you know, turf wars of the staff at the staff level, whether it be agency directors or ninth floor staff, eighth floor staff, and, you know, every governor prior to this, you've had all these little infightings that you, that you can hear about. Um, and I didn't, I don't think I ever heard one. No, no. no and there, there yeah. was nothing really, you know, in his inner circle part. There were some, there were some misses on some, you know, agency directors that kind of imploded, but he handled those quickly and he handled those well and, and and your staff handled those well and i think that's that was the difference it, it didn't blow out of proportion where a lot of those could have there could have been some major crises but i think one of the things that would, that set him apart as a leader for as governor was that he didn't he didn't allow you know the petty rivalry exactly of of the staff to get in the way yeah i mean um a lot of us were and are friends, and um, and you know, again, I, he set this vision in his management style where he just said, "I'm not a fan of office politics. You know, I don't want it." And and no leaks was really a big mantra, and we really, and I think it's been a frustration for the press and the outside <laughs> world that it's really hard to know, you know, what's he doing next, you know, what all these things that that kind of the palace intrigue. Um, but we were we were really you know that being in senior staff, you just knew you know you didn't go home and talk to your family about it, you didn't talk to your friends at the bar about it, and you just didn't gossip about things and um and you really need that culture driven because we've all worked in scenarios where you don't have that, and I think it you know it's a i think we saw it as a challenge for some of the campaigns this year, mm -hmm. you know I think I mean. There was just, I feel like we all knew everything that was happening yeah. in some of these campaigns. So you do need to really drive that culture. Yeah. Well, speaking of the campaign, so this was a, a challenging cycle. Uh, there That's was, a lovely euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong about a lot of things. Um, but well, it, you but know, we're, we, we're, we're on the Eating Crow Tour. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we had Rich Tao on last week, and we're going we're to have uh, Simon Rosenberg on at the beginning of the year, just to, just because to, they were right. To take our whippings, because, you know, I was overly optimistic. I mean, I was looking at, you know, historical norms, and what I missed was how much of an impact uh, being an election denier and a Trumpy as a candidate would do in a general. And so what we saw were uh, candidates who weren't election deniers or Trumpy, uh, Kimberly Yee, do basically the baseline of, you know, 55, 56%. That's in line with, uh, with what Governor Ducey got in his reelect of 57%. So it shows that Arizona is gen generally a red state if you have a, just a mainline Republican. I think we saw that with Juan down, mm -hmm. in, and you yeah. were a part of that campaign. Correct. Yeah, well done. Um, and you saw and it with, and that's incredible. 
Yeah. Well, but even we more incredible that than that bit. was Matt Gress getting elected an LD4 uh, to the state legislature. I mean, that was he was the top vote getter, which was astounding. That was awesome. You know, well, talk to and, us about that. Yeah. Well, and Chris, <laughs> I mean, you know, from uh, being from southern Arizona, the challenge. The People's of, Republic. <laughs> yeah. Of winning in Pima County. And Juan actually outperformed um, Carrie Lake. By close to six points and outperformed Blake Masters by almost 12 points. Wow. So, um, and in in Matt's district in LD4, which ha- actually had the highest amount of ticket splitting of any legislative district in the entire state, uh, the entire slate lost the district other than Kimberly Yee, and, and Rachel Mitchell did really well. She won it by seven points. So, um, so. I mean, I think that uh, part of this, quite frankly, is, yes, it's the tone of the candidates. Um, You can't run around saying that um, Steve Bannon is George Washington. (laughs) Uh, You you can't uh, tell. You know, I think I mentioned something about that (laughs) a couple weeks before the campaign (laughs) ended. Like, you know, the whole Steve Bannon, Charlie Kirk on stage giving high fives might have been a mistake. Yeah. I mean, I don't I think even saying we're going to we're not going to let these bastards get away with it. You know, I mean, keep in mind who our coalition is. Yeah. Yeah, they are. They I think there are a lot of people of of a certain age um, who just don't think that's appropriate and they're Republicans. Yeah. So um, so I think that some of the tone of the campaigns and then quite frankly, I think a lot of these campaigns lacked basic uh, campaign infrastructure. Um, I don't think they were focused on the right things. I think a lot of the get out the vote efforts were for show. Um, and I think it was a lot of razzle dazzle and kind of the, the meat and potatoes of a campaign that we've been involved with was really lacking. Yeah. And when you look at the margin in these races, I mean, 17,000 votes is what Katie Hobbs will win the governor's race by. If you add up all the Republican rural counties and you look at the delta between Yee and Lake, it's 18,000 votes. And right. so That's I, amazing. there were votes left on the table, Republican votes, and we could have got slaughtered in Pima, we could have lost Maricopa. Um, but I just, I don't think that the candidates in the campaigns were, were focused on both talking about the right issues. We knew that it, the economy was a huge issue. We knew that the Dobbs decision was a big issue, but that wasn't a lane really that, you know, we were ever going to do anything other than maybe fight to a draw. Right. But I just didn't hear anybody talking about the economy. I didn't hear the some of these statewide candidates talking about that, and I don't think it was the animating issue of their campaign, and I don't think they were very comfortable talking about it. Right. We talked about it in a podcast last week about the three, I call it the three-legged stool of conservative politics, faith, freedom, free enterprise, which right. is what we're, you know, the show is based on. And when I was hearing from business leaders in this community specifically, it might have been even the same a little bit down in Tucson, that that Carrie Lake was giving them the you know the middle finger for lack of a better word, you know then you're 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 alienating yourself with that free enterprise coalition, and if you have those people either not showing up or not working for you, you're going to lose. I, I totally agree, and and look, I and I think we're all probably the, on the same page here. I mean, I don't think the takeaway is we got to cave on our principle. No, exactly. Um, I don't not. think the takeaway is that we need rank choice voting. Um, I, I don't think those are the things that are gonna solve this. I think that it's exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's getting back to the fundamentals of why are we conservative and persuading people who may not think of themselves as conservative that like those are good things, that you know we need jobs, we need to keep more of our money, our kids should get to go to the schools they wanna go to. And we need to be able to sell that agenda to to people. And when we can't even win our own party right. and we have leakage in, in our in our own base, that's a real problem. Yeah. Well, well talk to us a little bit about Juan's campaign mm-hmm. down there, because, I mean, that district was kind of carved out specifically. I mean, let's be honest, for 
possible a possible Republican win, and 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 yet I mean it was it was a close race, and you you had to have Democrats and Independents as well coming over and and embracing Juan as their congressman. How did you how did you tailor that message to that that electorate? Well, the one thing I would just I'd push back on a little bit is okay. this is still a really tough district. Oh, you know? that's, oh yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's yeah, what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so um, I don't know. I'm it, not saying that it wasn't tough. I'm saying that <laughs> no, it, but, but my when, point is when it somebody, was drawn, I, I, I heard from certain people like, Hey, this, this is ideal for some, for a Republican can win this district versus, you know, what, you know, Grijalva's district. And my point is if somebody was drawing it to be for a Republican, they didn't do a very yeah. good job. <laughs> they didn't do much favors, right? You're right that it is di- difficult, and this environment turned out to be really difficult. I mean, first of all, Juan is such a great candidate. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. what a great guy. You guys know him. He's a, been a friend um, and a coworker for a long time. And um, he had a great message, uh, a great story of, you know, being an American, becoming an American, and and um, really appreciating the, the American dream. And it was a message that he went into in the primary Republican rooms and we'd get a standing ovation in places like uh, Saddlebrook, you know, really conservative right. parts of the state. But it also was something that was really appealing, I think, across the aisle. And in the general, I mean, honestly, I think you could go back and look at all our ads, all our messaging, and there wasn't a big shift from the primary to the general, and he did have He didn't have a to make a big pivot. Yeah, and he did have a competitive primary, um, but a lot of what he talked about in the general was, you know, rejecting the extremism. He, The Democrats were trying desperately to tie him to um, to other Republicans in the state, and, um, and I, I think that people just didn't buy it because he had a positive message about what he wanted to do. And, you know, and you know this, um, Chris, I mean, you go to Tucson, it's not even game day, and you go to, like, Safeway, and everybody has U of A, you know, stuff on. And and so Juan wore U of A stuff in his ads and talked about, like, we all come together for U of A basketball. Why can't, you know, Congress do do the same thing? So I think it was a message that really fit the district, the community, and uh, and it worked. Well, that reminds me of what Barry Goldwater used to say about campaigning, and that is, if you, you, them, they'll yes, you. <laughs> and that, and, yeah. and, and, and to have that type of imagery is that you're doing precisely that. You're saying, you can be a part of what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Join me. And it was authentic, it, it wasn't a, yeah, forced. It's not, yeah. fake. it's not fake, he's not a fake person. He yeah. doesn't come off as that way. And I'm sure, and the retail side, he did a really good job with. And that's oh, where, yeah. and that's where a lot of candidates fall short. They just, they're aloof or they leave, you know, they leave events early. They don't stick around. They don't, they don't spend time listening and, and speaking to the people who really are genuinely concerned about the direction of the country. I, I agree. And I will say that, um, look, I was really impressed by Carrie Lake as a, as a retail politician and I was very supportive of her. Um, and so, you know, some of the, the, this post-mortem that we're all doing, I, I also didn't predict this outcome. Um, but I do think looking back, and I was not involved in the campaign, I just tried to help where I could. Um, I do think that if maybe we were talking to ourselves too much, yep. and you know, I think if she had gotten into other audiences and other rooms, and met people who were not, you know, just the same hundred people showing up to everything. Again, I think you know you can find seventeen thousand votes in this state. Yeah. Well, I mean, you think I think that is that is a great point. There's a yeah, was, there's a lot the of talking chamber. to ourselves. The, it was echo the echo chamber. chamber. It was the same people showing up at the, the rallies and you know them thinking, oh, we've got all these people. Look at this. This is amazing. But it's people. I mean, they were roadies basically. Um, but when you basically say, if you are a McCain guy, I don't want your vote. Well, there's definitely 17,000 plus votes right there. Yeah. Uh, no question. I mean, McCain was revered because he was a, you know, he was a genuine person. You may have disagreed with him on some policy points, but I agreed with him probably 80% of the time. But, it, but and that's, that's what Reagan talked about. You know, just, but, but even if you're telling the business community that, Hey, you know, when I'm in office, there's, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to really need, need you, which is apparently what she told the GPL. 
that doesn't work. That's just you're creating, you're alienating yourself to, to the, you know, the three-legged stool. You need to be able to go in the churches, talk about faith, and meet with faith communities. The freedom people she had. Yeah. I mean, the Freedom Coalition, that was her coalition. Okay, great. You built that coalition over the course of the primary. You don't need to keep going back to them two weeks right. before she the, had the, she the, needs to expand, the electorate, expand the getting on stage with Steve Bannon and Charlie Kirk, and, and alienating independents, alienating conservative Democrats. And, you know, and then the messaging kind of goes off. Uh, that reminds me of uh, 2002 when Salmon was running against Napolitano. Uh, last weekend before the election, he went to a big NRA thing in Tucson. Right before the general. Not the greatest thing. You know, he ended up losing by 11, 12,000 votes. Oh, yeah, that was even closer. Um, you know, it's, you just, you got to use some judgment about where you're, where you're going to be, what your message is going to be, <clears throat> because you have your base. I mean, he didn't have, there was no NRA member that was going to vote against Matt Salmon. No. So. Well, and I'm, I, look, I'm sensitive to this because it's so easy to say, you know, what we would have done. Yeah, what it could have. But yeah. en uh, enough people have said what I should have done on stuff, so I feel like I can do, do the same. I mean, <laughs> the, the um, you know, imagine if instead of going to, to, to Texas after winning the primary, um, you, you campaigned in Arizona. And mm -hmm. I do think, um, and again, this is where the buck stops with the candidate, but I do think that um, Carrie was poorly served in many ways yeah. because I do think she had a lot of um, potential talent as a candidate. Um, I really think that they became overly focused more on post-election day. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And what you know, you would hear about working groups and different things that were happening to talk about policy and talk about transition. And I'm just a big believer that um, I don't think those are healthy conversations on a competitive race. If you're going to win by double digits, then okay, start you know populating your administration. But I really think that um, that the campaign that all of that becomes a distraction to winning and again, look at how close it is. And I think that too much energy and calories were burnt on talking about what would happen after election yep, day. That's a great point. You, the transition should start the day after the election, mm -hmm. not a moment before. Yeah. Not a moment before. Yeah, never believe, you know, your own press. Well, <laughs> two weeks before yeah, every vote. We, yeah. we, you know, you, you made the point, Sean, early on about what, what went on in Nevada, you know, Every vote counts. You don't you don't close up shop two weeks before the election and think you have it in the back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and that goes to your point about the, the get out the vote efforts there. There was not the typical blocking and tackling it on a on a statewide scale that needed to happen. I mean, it obviously happened in some individual races. One was a good example, Matt. Um, but it didn't happen at the Senate race, didn't happen at the governor's race. Um, you know, if you don't have a, a concerted get out the vote effort, it's going to hurt. The other thing is, I just think the Democrats ran circles around us both um, on the statewide and the legislative level when it came to allocation of resources. I mean, if you look at all of Katie Hobbs ads, they say paid for by the Arizona Democratic Party authorized by Katie Hobbs. They were clearly, and this is all legal. In fact, these laws were written by Republicans. Right. We just haven't figured out how to utilize them. Right. They were, you know, funneling unlimited individual and possibly corporate donations through the state party rather than her campaign and um and she's allowed to fully coordinate so i i i think they were so much more savvy you saw this in every legislative district across the state and i think a, a lot of legislative seats were left on the table um that could still be won because i don't think really there was i didn't really see anything uh, negative against the Democrats, right. but our candidates were taking on a lot of water. Yep. So well, now you're getting into the elephant in the room in, in some ways. And that's, and I don't want to put you on the spot on this, but it's the brokenness of the Republican party in Arizona, which has been broken for years. And that's because of the leadership. I mean, I'll just say it. I mean, Kelly Ward needs to go. I don't, I don't think she's running for re-election, right? right? But, I mean, she but, needed to go a long was, time yeah, ago. Yeah, I mean, it's been and a it's been, it's been a mess. And if you talk to the donor class, it's been a mess for a long time. And nobody wants to give to the party. Nobody wants anything to do with the party. 
because of her leadership. And when you have a, a party chairwoman who is putting her finger, you know, on the pulse of every race and picking winners and losers, which is what she, she did in many of these races, it just turns people off. So I'm, I'm not asking you to comment on that, but it, <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, just, I, I am a I, big tent guy. I, I, um, have known Kelly a long time and she has been helpful to me on, on a number of fronts. Um, I think that, um, I, I don't know what her plans are, but I, yeah. I think that, um, that it, it, there are all these different groups out there. There's the state party, there's the stuff the legislature does. Um, and it, and I think, you know, as we step back from the election and figure out what do we do now, um, there should be a discussion about how we make all this stuff, this Republican ecosystem work together better. How do we leverage resources and, and how do we get to that big tent um, where instead of attacking each other, we're, we're attacking the Democrats. And that's what I like to do. Um, so that's why it's challenging for me in some of these intra-party fights. Sure. Because I would rather be spending our time going after the Democrats. And we're now all going to have to live with the consequences of these elections. Absolutely. And I think that... Um, that if the Republicans are smart, uh, particularly in the legislature, they will talk about how we can't have one party control, how we need to have a check on the e executive and um, and utilize that to start building the campaign for 2024. Yeah, no, I Great agree point. with you. Great point. Talk to us a little bit. And in the last couple of minutes we have with you, you your podcast. Yeah. How did that come about? What uh, how's it going? I think it's going well. It's been a lot of fun. It came about because I would have fun conversations like this with friends, and we figured, well, why not just start recording it? So, yeah. um, so that was really the genesis. And um, and there's so many interesting people in this community and in this state. And so some of it, what we really have tried to do is, most of the people are political. But we actually don't talk that much about politics. We'll talk a little bit about it, but we like to talk about other stuff um, in the news or restaurants or whatever. Um, so it's a way to, I think, get people in politics, let their guard down a little bit and, and talk about some, some other stuff. That's cool. Yeah, that's great. That's very cool. Good for you. Thank you. Wish you luck on that. No, I appreciate it. So uh, you can find that Scarp and Friends. Scarp and Friends. Uh, Scarpandfriends.com. It's my Twitter is at Scarpinato. We post all of them up there. Great. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, well congratulations. Uh, thanks for coming on. No, appreciate I appreciate it. Yeah, especially it. kind of last minute, but we no, appreciate you being here. Thanks, and uh, you congratulations on much success this last cycle. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, you you were one of the bright spots. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I was lucky to work with some really good candidates. Yeah, you were. You were. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Daniel, for right. being here. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Thanks, everybody. God bless. Take care. See you.